if the federal's, uh, federal level can't. And Trump attempts to pardon individuals who have been indicted. Maybe they'll go the state way. Now, Mark Stein is an author and columnist, also hosted this program last night, great contributor on Fox & Friends, one of our favorite all-time guests. Now, Mark, why is it a big deal that the Attorney General of New York has an interest in this investigation and is providing documents in this investigation reportedly? Well, Schneiderman, for a start, is an explicitly political Attorney General, which is actually something that is malodorous in, in itself. When I a declared Democrat. Yeah, that's right. When I, when I testified to Ted Cruz's committee in the Senate a couple of years ago, I cited Schneiderman for uh, essentially doing an end run around the first amendment. In other words, this is a sleazy guy who likes politically driven uh, prosecutions and investigations. And that's exactly what he, what he did with ExxonMobil is now what he's doing with Trump. He's just, as you say, he's written a blog post claiming that what all these acts he's taken as Attorney General have in common is that they all go after Trump. The Attorney General, in any system of cabinet government, the, the Attorney General is supposed to be the least partisan member of any cabinet or any administration because he is there to administer the laws, which are administered not on the grounds of whether you're left-wing or right-wing, right. but on the grounds uh, of uh, the fact that you're a citizen equal before the law. So what we, we wanted to see as Americans is an investigation to find out what the Russians did or didn't do in the right. election. So if you're seeing how many declared Democrats who aggressively gone after his actions says to more Trump documents than anybody else is playing a role. A former state re senator, Democrat, right. who actually has been going back and forth with Trump since 2010 after first asking for a campaign contribution. Right. And, and, and as you said, the point here is to prevent uh, Trump being able to pardon these individuals. In other words, this is all about muscle. Uh, Mueller's concerned that because Trump is the president, when Mueller goes after uh, Trump cabinet officials like Flynn, in the end, uh, Trump can say, I'm going to pardon the guy. Uh, but uh, he's gone to Schneiderman to say, OK, uh, I want to lean on them. And they should know that if, uh, even if the president pardons you at the federal level, you're still going to be screwed over at the state level. That's actually a form of uh, double jeopardy, as it were, for these guys. So, I mean, put it this way. It's gotten personal already. So right. if you want an unbiased investigation, you don't work with Eric Schneiderman if you're Robert Mueller. No. Even if you think that Trump is innocent or guilty, you don't want the appearance. Now, the president's come back with him with some beauties, no. as he would no. say. He's called him a total loser and no. a lightweight. The president's called him Revlon Iowa. Uh, uh, Revlon right. eyes because right. he accuses him of wearing eyeliner. Right. He also is, has two separate investigations going into the Trump organization. Right. They have, this is personal. This yeah. is not professional. No. And now he's president and the attorney general is trying to make a name for him. But look, it's everything that an independent investigation should not be. Uh, I mean, you had the guy, uh, Comey, uh, who, who, when he was removed as FBI uh, director, then gets his mentor appointed special counsel, who then forms an alliance with a guy who's got a history. A an independent counsel is supposed to be independent. I don't want to come the uh, unassimilated foreigner on you, bro. In Northern Ireland, when they had to have an investigation right. over decommissioning of arms, they got a Canadian general because he's not connected to any of the players. When uh, the Solomon Islands was in danger of going belly up, they got uh, an Australian uh, 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 intelligence guy to go in there. The Turks and Caicos, they bring in an English judge. You don't bring in a so-called independent council who's right. tied into everybody, who keeps on the team a bunch of hardcore Democrats who've been to Hillary's victory party, who brings in possibly the most partisan right. uh, state attorney general in the country. Everything about this smells and everything about it uh, suggests that the real issue here is not foreign interference in the U.S. election, but domestic interference. Think about the other probes and the other investigations. Mm. They sit back, and I know where Democrats mm. did criticize Ken Starr, right. but for the most part, you sit back and you keep your fingers crossed. You provide the documents and try to prove your innocence. Call yeah. Rove successful, Scooter Libby not. Right. People don't like the way that went. They look back. But 
But this president is different. He says, I got a problem with the upper echelon and the FBI. Right. The rank and file, I don't have a problem with. Right. Then he says, I have a problem with the, the types of attorneys and investigators that are going after this. Don't ever do that. Well, I did it. And now it's beginning to prove correct, and there's reason for concern. However, yeah. for those out there who think that the president's getting this the right way, I have to point out that there's some people that sense a different way. Michael Isikoff in today's playbook on Politico says, the Mueller probe outgrows the witch hunt phase. He says, sources familiar with the probe say that such a rapid conclusion, which his attorneys mm -hmm. say, they say it's fanciful. It's going to continue. Mueller and his team are pursuing new leads, interrogating new witnesses, and collecting a mountain of new evidence, including subpoenaed bank records and thousands of emails. So yeah. if this is in fact true, what is he doing? Well, right now... Is he, he supposed, what does that do with Russia? Right now, it's got nothing to do with Russia. He's got a couple of guys on things that were years before Trump ever ran for president. And he's got a couple of guys on process crimes, which are the most malodorous aspects of the FBI's powers. Uh, you and I know that if we went and talked to the FBI for, for 40 minutes, they could nail us on something or other that we misremembered there. That crime should not exist. It is particularly ludicrous in this investigation that people are having to plead guilty to lying to the FBI when you have uh, things like an associate, uh, whatever he is, associate deputy, deputy associate, undersecretary uh, of justice, uh, who doesn't even tell uh, the attorney general uh, that he's been meeting with Christopher Steele and the Fusion GPS guys and his wife works for Bruce Fusion Orr. GPS. Uh, yeah. Bruce Orr. Yeah. Yeah. Now, where, why, where's his uh, not uh, being fully forthcoming in the investigation? The FBI and the, uh, the, the, the Department of Justice can lie to us, but, uh, but if Flynn lies, right. that's it. Mark Stein, thanks so much. Thanks, Brian. More elements to this, and let's talk about it. Uh, meanwhile, in the House, there is a drama over the infamous Trump dossier. You got the House Intelligence Committee has subpoenaed John McCain's associate, his name is David Kramer, seeking more information on the sources behind the dossier. Kramer met with the dossier's author. You know, it's Christopher Steele, the big investigator with a great reputation. And that happened at McCain's request, and then transferred documents to McCain that were handed over to the FBI, at which time the FBI says, oh, I got these already. Molly Hemingway is a senior editor at The Federalist. Tom Bevan is. He's co-founder of Real Clear Politics. They both join us. So, Molly, when we talk about this dossier, where does McCain, why is that is of interest to find out how McCain got it and why his associate gave it to him? You know, there's been a lot of interest in the in the role John McCain played in getting the dossier to the FBI. We now know that the FBI actually had the dossier months prior to that, and in fact, it was handed over in installments as it was being collected, which is pretty interesting, if not scandalous information in, in and of itself. But what's interesting about this is this guy came in, this McCain aide came in, and wasn't willing to tell who the sources were. He says he knows who the sources were in some cases, but he wasn't willing to say who they were. That's it. Absolutely true that Americans have every right to know who the sources are for each and every unfounded or unverified salacious allegation that has spawned this sprawling battle. But it would be forthright and honest when they're talking to investigators. And David Kramer works at the nonprofit McCain Institute, so he handed this off. Now, Tom, we know there's personal animus, or there was, between McCain and President Trump because of the shot uh, President Trump took at him and maybe other things. So, having said that, David Kramer really has nothing to hide. If he just got handed a dossier, he didn't write it, and handed it in, what's the mystery here? Well, that's a great question. I mean, and I agree with Molly. I mean, he should testify, and, and there's no reason that he shouldn't be able to tell the House Intel Committee what, who those sources were. And we need to be able to know who those sources were to make assessments and value judgments about the veracity of the information. That's what, you know, critics of this, of this dossier say it's, it's totally unfounded, uh, all these salacious argue, uh, uh, allegations unfounded. And critics of Trump say, look, this thing is, you know, may be true, and, and they believe that a lot of it is. We need to know where these sources are, who the sources were, and where the information is coming from. It's also interesting, too, Brian, you go back to the feud between, between uh, McCain and Trump. He sent David Kramer over to meet with Steele after the election, this was after this was in mid to late November, and then proceeded uh, to pass this dossier directly to Jim, James Comey. So uh, that in and of itself is pretty interesting that McCain would go to these lengths to do this after Trump was elected. And then you just want to know, Molly, and we're about to find out when the Inspector General, who was put forward by.
Congress, who's preventing others from coming forward and saying the role the dossier played in the um, unmasking of other people who worked on some level with President Trump and into this overall investigation. The FBI, perhaps, is about to be extremely embarrassed at the high level uh, with this investigation. Maybe we're about to find that out as many head for the exits, including Andrew McCabe in 2018. Well, what's really important is for the FBI and the Department of Justice to simply answer Congress's questions about the dossier, about its use in securing a wiretap against a Trump campaign affiliate. They have been really, really um, not forthright about their role, and that is causing a lot of problems for investigators. And in fact, Devin Nunes, the chairman of the House Oversight Committee, just sent a letter to Rod Rosenstein saying that all the information needs to be turned over by January 3rd. They'd previously claimed that they didn't have documents, that it turns out they do have. All of this is very important, and I think people are growing right. tired of that uh, obstruction that they're seeing there. And, Tom, real quick, 35 pages long, among its allegations that Russia has been cultivating President Trump, the host of The Apprentice, for 10 years at the behest of Vladimir Putin because they knew he was going to be president and they wanted to control the country. <laughs> it sounds plausible. Right. I mean, some of the allegations in the dossier are just, you know, so wild and, and beyond belief. Um, but to, look, to the overall point, right, this is the this document is the one that spawned the entire investigation. We've been a year now yep. arguing and uh, over these cries of collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia, not Russian interference in the election, but collusion. And so far, we have not seen anything to verify that. Um, and we're a year into this, and it's going to go on much longer. All right, uh, Molly, Tom, great job. Thanks so much. Have a great new year. You too. You too. All right, coming up straight ahead, we have shocking stats on chain migration. Just how fast are people entering the United States? We'll reveal those numbers, then try to get over it when we come back. Don't go anywhere. We tend to have the discussion about the wall with respect to illegal immigration problem, but you can't forget it's criminals, it's traffickers, it's smugglers, it's special interest aliens, potentially terrorists. It's all the same pathways. Mm -hmm. The transnational criminal organizations are happy to sell their services to anyone. Right. Right. So we really need to stop their ability to cross. Uh, that was me. I had the pl uh, privilege of going to the border two weeks ago to the Rio Grande sector with Homeland Security Secretary Kirsten Nielsen. Immigration, legal and illegal, huge issue in this country and the United States in 2017 and 18. Even one year into the Trump administration, it's still a big deal. How big? Well, according to a new research study by the Center for Immigration Studies, they're analyzing Census Bureau figures, a record 1.8 million people entered the U.S. legally or illegally in 2016. That's up 700,000 from 2011. Overall, since 2006, the U.S. has absorbed 14 million immigrants because a lot of it through chain migration. Steve Camerata is director of the research for the Center of Immigration Studies. Raul Reyes is an attorney and columnist. And Steve, let's start with you. Do those numbers bother you? Well, I think the big question is this whole system essentially runs on autopilot. That is, we just keep taking folks. People sponsor, we, we hand out visas through the lottery, employers want someone, they bring them in, but nobody steps back and says, look, does this 1.8 million make sense? What is the absorption capacity for our schools or for our hospitals, our roads, our physical infrastructure? How many people can we assimilate? These are all really important questions. And in general, no one's asking them. Right. And uh, I'll tell you, Raul, you have uh, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada all with one thing in common. They have a merit-based immigration, mm -hmm. merit immigration system. In 1965, right. we changed ours. Don't you think we should mm -hmm. reevaluate mm -hmm. what we're doing? Well, in 1965, one of the reasons that we changed ours under the Immigration and Nationality Act was because the old system tended to give preference to uh, people from Western Europe and Northern Europe. So back, the Congress back then decided they wanted a more egalitarian approach. They changed the system to what we have now. And what some people refer to as uh, chain migration, uh, which, which actually the American Immigration Lawyers Association considers a pejorative term, is also known as the family unity principle. And the family unity principle really has been a bedrock of our immigration system since 1965. I know a lot of people, I, I don't dispute these numbers. I think the, maybe the difference I have with Mr. Camerati is our interpretation of them. I look at these numbers and I say, well, we, we are admitting a large numbers of people 
uh, legal, through legal channels, right. and some people are coming, obviously, undocumented. But meanwhile, we have a 4.1 unemployment rate at 17-year uh, low. This is a historic low under this administration. So that shows to me, to me in my view, right. that our economy does have the capacity to, uh, to okay. integrate these workers. But we also have an American culture to perpetuate, I think, forward. We shouldn't be embarrassed by it. Mm -hmm. We should embrace it. We've got a unique background in history. Right. And we might be running from it. What I found stunning, Steve, is that in New York, 28 percent. In Los Angeles, excuse me, in California, over 30 percent. Texas, same thing. Nevada, what am I saying? 30 percent of, and plus of these households speak, uh, uh, speak uh, Spanish, not English. The English is our national language. Is that something for America to worry about? Look, we all first, recognize that English first is language. Not only do they have the ability to speak Spanish, but that's, that's, they only speak Spanish in their households. Right. We could talk about the economics, but maybe some of the more important questions are the ones you raised. How many people can we absorb? Once immigration gets so big, it tends to overwhelm the assimilation process because one of the ways assimilation works is immigrants and their kids basically get submerged in a sea of natives and their kids. But in many school systems in the United States, the majority of the kids now come from a foreign language background, often Spanish, though other languages. And so what we have now is a situation of about 67 million people who speak a language other than English at home. This doesn't just create ch challenges for our schools, but it does in many parts of the country represent a real challenge to English as the dominant form of communication. And we know that English is one of the glues that holds the country together. Right. Uh, Raul, of course. Go, right. English, of course. So we agree on that. So, Raul, in the, in oh, the big picture. Absolutely. And it's, you know you, who else uh, agrees with that is... Uh, when you talk to uh, Im Im recent immigrants, people who have been here a long time, and this, is sh this has been borne out by studies from the nonpartisan Pew, uh, Pew, Pew Center, the number one concern for undocumented and legal immigrants in this country is to learn English quickly because they understand if you don't know English, you can't get a job, you cannot function, you cannot be part of society. And we see that, for example, in our Latino population, the first generation that gets here you're right, they speak mostly Spanish. Second generation, maybe they're bilingual. By the third generation, the Spanish is gone. Mm -hmm. They are English dominant. That has happened you know, among members of my own family. I have right. my, my, I, my family background is Mexican-American. There are people in my family who don't know any Spanish. And that's a pattern we've seen again and again. So it's not so much a threat to American values or assimilation. What it is, it's just a different way of contributing to the fabric of the nation. The chain migration in particular is being visited uh, in immigration reform over the next month. I understand a bipartisan Senate committee already meeting and they're going to do something bipartisan, keep your fingers crossed, because we've got to do something together at some point, uh, Steve, that they're going to go ahead. And I think chain mig migrations being looked at because it's not just the nuclear family that's coming here, it is the extended family. And after a while, most of the mm. immigrants coming here are off chain migration. Or now this a lottery system is under scrutiny, especially because one, uh, a couple of these guys come over, they turn out to be terrorists. So do you believe that we're doing the right thing in reexamining both those elements of immigration? Absolutely. I think that makes a lot of sense. Remind your listeners, the way it works is if someone is here and becomes a citizen, an immigrant, he can then sponsor, say, a brother or sister or an, and, and parents or any adult children they have. And after a few years, those people can then sponsor. So if you brought in your brother and his wife and children, then yeah. your brother's sister can then sponsor her siblings. And it kind of goes on and on. And that's why pe most right. people use the term chain migration. But none of that, it's clear, doesn't necessarily make sense for the United States. Because those people are not entering based on their skills or the needs of the U.S. economy or anything like that. They're entering simply because they have a relative here who sponsors them. Right. And that's really the big question. Does that make sense for our country? And now, now let me just take this moment to say have a great new year. Thanks so much for the debate. This will be the number one debate in January. Thank you, too. And uh, we'll have you both back. Okay, thank you, Happy sir. Happy new year. Or I'll put in a good word with Tucker. I don't have that type of power to bring you back. Vanity Fair lashed out at Hillary Clinton. Now they're backpedaling while President Trump watches, laughs, and tweets. That story next. It's time to start working on your sequel to your book, What Happened? What the hell happened? Get someone on your tech staff to disable autofill on your iPhone so that typing an F doesn't become form exploratory committee for 2020. You know, on Anderson Cooper, you were telling him about alternate nostril breathing. 
You seem really adept. You should try teaching a class. Take more photos in the woods. How else are you going to meet unsuspecting hikers? Take up a new hobby in the new year. Volunteer work, knitting, improv comedy, literally anything that'll keep you from running again. To finally put away your James Comey voodoo doll. Now we all know you think that James Comey cost you the election, and he might have, but so did a handful of other things. It's a year later and time to move on. So cheers to you, Hillary Clinton. Cheers to you, Hillary. Cheers to you, Hillary Clinton. Kind of funny, right? Well, that was Vanity Fair begging Hillary Clinton to not run again. It happens. It's called comedy. And instead of running again, go quietly away. Now they're getting huge backlash for it with subscribers angrily attacking them and even burning the magazine. President Trump is taking delight in the magazine's plight, tweeting today, and by the way, they apologize quickly, Vanity Fair, which looks as, as if it's on its last legs, they laid off, a, uh, laid off a bunch of people, is bending over backwards and apologizing for the minor hit they took at Crooked Hillary, Anna Wintour, which was all set, who was all set to be ambassador to the court of St. James and a big fundraiser for Crooked Hillary, is beside herself in grief and begging for forgiveness. who are mad that they would try to bring up something funny about Hillary Clinton? Well, I think there's a little bit of both going on there. First off, Vanity Fair, you know, is light humor. This is what they do. This is their audience. Some of their audience was very upset. That's why they apologized. But look, Hillary Clinton supporters clearly have a right to still be upset. She won by 2.9 million votes in the popular vote. Furthermore, we have the grabber-in-chief. We have the Me Too movement happening. They have every right to be upset about it. But clearly, the Democratic Party doesn't want her to run in 2020. We need to be looking for younger and more diverse members right. of the party to step forward here in 2020. I think Vanity Fair did the right thing, issuing an apology. That's Why? a smart business move what did they by do? an American company. But what did they do? They took a political figure, and they did sarcastic comedy on it. You might not think it's funny, but it's free game. Right. You have to admit, our husband, they went after him every night on late night. No one goes, no one gets beaten up like President Trump on a regular basis. Why isn't she open season? After all, even though she sold a lot of books, the whining for three months is a source of comedy, usually. Yeah, well, but here's the deal. Again, if you own a business, Brian, and your customers are mad at something that you just did, you do an easy apology. It, of course, Vanity Fair is going to apologize. They need to keep their subscriber base. By the way, the president was factually incorrect yet again today in his tweet. Vanity Fair is doing just fine. The latest numbers I saw was a 2% year over year increase, partially because of his attacks on them last year brought a lot of attention and people added subscriptions in support of Hillary Clinton in opposition to President Trump. So I don't know why he's attacking them because, well, his attacks didn't work. It gave, it gave them more business. Well, Graydon Carter resigned from his post. He's been an enemy of the president. We do know they laid off a whole bunch of people last year, too. And the magazine industry has taken a pounding. But my feeling is this. A magazine is supposed to have an opinion and stand for something. I don't really know. Vanity Fair, it's not something I subscribe to or download. But I just think to apologize when you really didn't make a mistake or a spelling error is something. Do you see... Stephen Colbert apologizing to President Trump because going over the top, or Alec Baldwin going out of his way to apologize for his over the top impression. The guy selling a book that's, I believe, on the bestseller list that just mocks the president. A magazine takes some some subtle swipes at, at Hillary Clinton, and the supporters go absolutely crazy. In fact, one of them, uh, one of the Sarah Jones, who is a writer for a liberal magazine called uh, New Republic, observed that criticizing Hillary Clinton is a guarantee that you're going to get days of really violent abuse directed at you online and it sucks close quote really look you also uh, i mean let's let's be clear here you're picking out very specific people alec baldwin is making money because of his uh, impersonations of president trump so, so we should apologize? apologize of course van no of course vanity fair apologizes that's saving their subscriber base it's called a smart so business so it's not sincere decision. alec baldwin so should it's not, not apologize. sincere their Why apologies? Would he apologize so ethan it is not of sincere apology apologize. it's just look, to save not, subscribers not enough no look not enough people understand how easy an apology is more people in our society including the president himself should learn to apologize but, when you're wrong or you've done something to upset but somebody did, else. But it's what so did she easy do wrong? If you have a magazine that takes a position yeah. that a 
offends people and you have to apologize. Why do you have columnists? Why do you have opinion people? Ethan, in your opinion right now, you tick people off. Will you apologize? Do you feel compelled to apologize to people who don't agree with you and are ticked off listening to your opinion? But, but these are to totally different target audiences. Brian, you and I speak about things that are controversial. Vanity Fair doesn't so much, and because they did something that was satirical, light humor, but it offended a large number of their subscriber base, of course, that is a smart business decision. We talk about it, you know, President Business here, excuse me, gotcha. President Trump, and, we, and we, we're talking about, you know, business in America. He's attacking an American business. Why is he not focusing today on Russia, Turkey, and Iran forming an right. axis of evil in the Middle East instead of Vanity Fair? Well, I know. Uh, that's him, and that's what made him successful in business and now in politics. Ethan, always great to see you. Have a great New Year's Eve. Brian, thank you. Happy right, New Year. Uh, straight ahead, this story you're not going to believe. New York Mayor Bill de Blasio has never been one to think of himself lightly. He loves himself. But this may take the cake. In an interview with Politico, de Blasio compared his own political setbacks with those of, Mahat those of Mahatma Gandhi. While de Blasio just won re-election in New York, he failed to promote a national progressive vision. And other Democrats around the country aren't eager to be associated with him. Usually he's napping. Perhaps because he's done things like to de decriminalize public urination. De Blasio says these Democrats, by not going to him, are screwing up by ignoring him. Quote, so every time someone tries something and it doesn't work, it invalidates something else they might go be doing going forward, de Blasio told Politico. Tell that to Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, to Gandhi. There's no leader who hasn't had setbacks. While down downplaying his own setbacks, de Blasio played up Hillary Clinton. Get this, saying that if she had listened to him, and run a more left-wing campaign, she would be president. Perhaps it's no surprise an anonymous top Democrat told Politico the reason de Blasio gets ignored is because Democrats, quote, don't respect him. But don't be surprised if he does run for president, even though his own governor and his own party hates him. All right, coming up straight ahead. It's not just nuclear weapons, new fears that North Korea could be developing, biological weapons. Yep, that story coming your way. Don't go away. There are new fears that North Korea is developing chemical or biological weapons after a recent defector was found to have anthrax antibodies in his blood. Meantime, today President Trump claimed to have anticipated the North Korean nuclear threat, tweeting this. I've been saying it a long, long time. Hashtag North Korea. He had the video to prove it, too. We have the nuclear weapons. They're going to have those weapons pointed all over the world and specifically at the United States. That was Hussein there on Meet the Press with Tim Russert. The president also criticized China's role in propping up North Korea, tweeting, caught red-handed, very disappointed that China is allowing oil to go to North Korea. There will never be a friendly solution to the North Korean problem if this continues to happen. Harry Katsianis is the director of defense studies at the Center for National Interest, and that was satellite video showing oil rigs pulling into North Korea. Harry, first off, biological weapons, does that change anything? I mean, it's, it's, it's something we've always suspected, Brian, for the longest time. You know, the North Koreans, we've been talking about this program for a while, about them having potentially as many 60 nuclear weapons. We know the North Koreans have as much as 5,000 tons of chemical weapons, probably about 130 to 160 missiles to mount those chemical weapons on. But now it seems pretty clear the North Koreans do have a biological weapons program. It's been rumored and been studied for a long time, perhaps as much as two decades, we've sort of speculated. But with this North Korean soldier having anti, uh, anthrax antibodies in his bloodstream, it seems to either confirm one of two things. Either it was a farmhand working on a farm and somehow got it. That's one way you can get anthrax or somehow he came in contact with it or he was inoculated for it in the military. So we have to be concerned. It's troubling. These people are starving to death. The soldiers that came by, the other one had a tapeworm a foot and a half long inside of them. What's happening if they're rotting from the inside? But let's talk about this oil in China. Uh, the fact is they're still dealing with it. Do you believe these could be private companies doing something the Chinese government doesn't know about? I don't think so, Brian. I, the, the Chinese have consistently cheated on U.N. Security Council resolutions. Think about this for a second, Brian. This is the 10th United, United Nations Security Council resolution with North Korea involving sanctions. The Chinese, it seems, according right. to the video... And I I think what President Trump did was a, was a bold step to go on Twitter, and I think it's pretty clear. The bromance between Xi Jinping and Donald Trump is over, and good riddance. I'm, I'm glad it's done, because the Chinese, they were only going to help us, but only to a certain extent.
Harry, I mean, we're building up a military presence there, but we know the risk of a military fight there. But we have to show we're willing to fight at the very least. Word is we're going to push on uh, trade, uh, trade restrictions and some type of sanctions on China. And we're going to get Europe's involvement in it to try to press this thing to a, to a peaceful conclusion. But the current situation of going on like this is not acceptable to President Trump, nor his chief of staff, nor the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, nor his secretary of defense. It's all coming to a head in 2018. Will this work, pressuring China with trade restrictions, because they could follow back with retribution, and the pain might be felt economically in both in the U.S. and in Europe? It's true, Brian, and I think the president right now has the right approach. He has what I and others have called essentially as the Python strategy. You squeeze the North Korean economy as hard as you possibly can, because remember this, the North Korean economy is its weakness. Its economy is one-third the size of my home state of Rhode Island. So if you make them feel the pain, it'll work. And with the Chinese, look, we have robust trade relations with China. It's worth $600 billion in terms of bilateral trade. But we also know that the Chinese helped the North Korean launder money through their banks. They've helped the North Koreans cheat on all different types of U.N. Security Council resolutions. So we need to be bold right. with, to China and tell them, look, if you're going to keep helping the North Koreans evade sanctions and essentially help them build nuclear weapons, that's going to hurt our relationships. And I right. hope that'll make them back down. Harry, keep working your contacts because by all accounts, this will be the number one international issue facing not only Nikki Haley at the U.N., but us here in the U.S. and, our, uh, and the Pentagon. Harry Cassianis, thanks so much. Thanks, Brian. All right, meanwhile, it's time for a special year-end edition of Final Exam. How well do you remember the events of the past 12 months? That contest, that quiz with two fine people, straight ahead. Where does the time go? It is now time for the final exam where we see which news professionals, and they are, and contributors have been paying attention to current events. Tonight, we close the 2017 edition with a special year in review. Our questions just won't span this past week. All of 2017 is on the table. This week's contestants are really bright. They are Fox News contributor Lisa Booth, playing herself as Lisa Booth, and Mark Stein, who once hosted the show earlier in the week. Are you guys ready? Yeah. I I just yeah. want to say I tried to get you to pull Donna Brazil this morning on Fox and Friends, and you wouldn't do it. So I would not man. give you the answers. You're why? An man. And you know why, Lisa? They don't give me the questions ahead of time because they know I'd break. Uh, Meanwhile, our contestants have buzzers, and okay. they have their hands on the buzzers. That's all I can ask you to do. We're I'm going to ask work. them questions just to review the rules. And the first one to buzz in gets to answer. You must wait until I finish the question before. It's not like a family feud. It's until I do it. If you get it wrong... It's not okay. Uh, you lose a point. No. If you get it right, you get a point. Yeah. And uh, the best of these five questions uh, gets uh, gets winning. So, uh, as gets, long as what I'm if we not, don't get any? Yeah, like you did. I mean, uh, with you <laughs> against Shannon Breen, the ref should have stopped that fight and scraped what was left of you off the canvas. So as long as we don't, as long as we avoid the uh, the kill me scenario. I thought if I did the best I can, it was okay, Mark. I, I'm going to try to pull Shannon Bream. All right, let's go. She's on fire. Ready? Sorry, Shannon, okay. you're off, so these guys are on. Here's the first question. Cast your mind back to the beginning of the year. We were children then. There was a big mess up at the Oscars with the presenters for the best picture regarding... Okay, I'm going to review the rules one more time. Yeah. You well, have to wait until I finish the question. Okay. Mark loses, I win, technicality. Let's keep going with the presenters of the best picture reading out the wrong winner. Which two acting legends were left red-faced after reading the wrong card? Before you answer, Mark, okay, give me your answer, Mark. Did you finish reading? You finished reading. Have you finished the question? <laughs> Faye Dunaway and Warren Beatty? Let's watch. The most embarrassing mistake some are saying in the award show history. Everyone talking about it. Yeah, Warren Beatty, Faye Dunaway, Hollywood's Bonnie and Clyde coming out there, and they robbed the Best Picture winner of their title. They read the wrong card. Moonlight was, in fact, the real winner. Turns out that the presenters were given the wrong envelope by mistake. 
You are correct, sir. Oh, One man. nothing mark. This is not a good, good start. job. Yeah. I don't watch award shows. Right. No, 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 no. Again, no, no, no. I, think, me I think the excuses after getting it wrong make it all the worse. So he said, <laughs> all right, and Barry, thanks for almost getting it right, Mark, with, by paying attention to the role. Okay. Question number two now. President Trump and North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un trading a lot of insults this year. Kim called Trump a dotard, among other things, and Trump unveiled his new nickname for Kim on the floor of the United Nations. What is that nickname? Lisa Booth. Rocket Man. Let's watch. President Trump said the U.S. may have no choice but to, quote, totally destroy North Korea. And he called out the dictator, Kim Jong-un. Rocket Man is on a suicide mission for himself and for his regime. Rocket Man, obviously the Elton John song. Right. I don't know why anyone in the mainstream media is complaining because he's calling, like you said, well, we've a never lunatic. Heard quite like that. Yeah. A nickname. <laughs> Dotard is the Elton John well, well, you, did, you know, I didn't think so. Um, judges, 1-1. One, one, correct. The as, judges long as, I, have... as long as I get one. Oh, okay. And by the way, just to review the score, 1-1. One, one. Okay. We are tied. We move okay. to question number three. All right. Mark and Lisa still playing themselves in this game, yes. and we are indeed playing almost live. Playing ourselves poorly. <laughs> Donald Trump sent the mainstream media into a complete meltdown this year. Wait, which time? <laughs> After <laughs> tweeting that could be the most famous typo of all time. What was that typo? Oh. Confeffi. Is it Confeffi? Watch. If you want me to say how to pronounce this word, I don't know. None of us here. <laughs> Kofif, Kofef, none of us really know how to say this. You Kofif, Kofefi, we're going to let you make the call this morning. That's where it hit the glitch. Kof. Fief, Kofef, Kofef, because you speak fluid French. I don't know. Does the president uh, speak French? Despite the constant <laughs> negative press, Kofef. Uh, this is his best one Kofefe. yet. Said, that was. What a year this has been. Yeah. No? You are 100 percent right. Lisa pulls ahead 2-1. Oh. But it's right. a typo that Sean Spicer says was not a typo, <laughs> which is still. Which how can that be? <laughs> how could he not just say he made a mistake? It's not no, It's a great. It's a great. Okay. Yeah. I think he could probably do it, though. He's very smart. Mark, he's very smart. He'll figure it the out. The chemistry you two have is starting to bug me, okay? <laughs> uh, question number four. It's a multiple-choice question. Okay. Oh, Hillary Clinton embarked on the world's longest book tour this year, and she explained in great detail all the things she has been up to since losing the election. She also <laughs> revealed that she's been drinking a lot of alcohol to deal with the stress what is Hillary's go-to drink of choice? Is it A, pina colada, B, Bloody Mary, or C, Chardonnay? Mark Stein. Chardonnay. Lame is, choice. Is it Chardonnay? Go to the tape. I won't lie. Chardonnay helped a little, too. <laughs> yes, I, I, I had my fair share of Chardonnay, so... Uh. <laughs> Try to calm myself down and, uh, you know, my share of Chardonnay. It was a very hard. Who doesn't like Chardonnay? Transition. My share of Chardonnay. Share of Chardonnay. That's another uh, I think that's all of it. The fixing is a very useful uh, tool. <laughs> to yeah, what, what happened? <laughs> you are 100% right, Chardonnay. And let's go check the scores now. 2-2. Two, two. <laughs> oh. Nobody, we've gotten the uh, right answer each and every time. Yeah. So this will be the tiebreaker if my oh, math is uh, correct. Oh, and well. often it isn't. <laughs> All right, uh, let's go. Final question. Back in the summer, ESPN faced a firestorm after it pulled an announcer from calling a University of Virginia football game. The reason? ESPN didn't like his name. What was the announcer's name? Oh. Robert E. Lee. Robert Lee. Lisa Booth says Robert Lee. Robert Lee. Judges, jot that down. Now I want to roll the tape. Fox News alert. There are reports tonight that 